Second Corinthians chapter 9 verse 1 There is no need for me to write to you about the service to the saints for I know your eagerness to help. I have been boasting about it to the Macedonians that since last year you and Achaia were ready to give. Your enthusiasm has stirred most of them into action. Verse 3 But I am sending the brothers in order that our boasting about you in this matter should not prove hollow, but that you may be ready. Verse 4 But if any Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to say anything about you, would be ashamed of having been so confident. Paul is bringing the Macedonians and he says, If what we have shared with them about you contradicts what you do, then we will be ashamed more than you. Paul actually is saying here, your enthusiasm has stirred most of them into action. Liberal giving, friends, is the real test, the acid test of any congregation of God. Some congregations have real spiritual vigor and vitality. They are great assemblies. They are generous, generous in giving. You know, friends, giving is worship. An assembly that gives is a blessed assembly. An assembly that does not give will start rusting. Other assemblies that have been really dead spiritually, it all started when they stopped giving. They are dead in their giving and therefore they are dead. The size of the offering is the barometer. Now you see that these Corinthian believers had made a pledge, a pledge that they would give something toward the relief of the believers in Jerusalem. May I say that any pledge that a believer makes is between that person and the Lord. It is a pledge to the Lord that you will do something or that you will give something. It is a completed pledge. A wealthy man who has asked, How in the world did you become so rich when you give so much away? Well, he answered, The Lord shovels it in. I shovel it out and God has a bigger shovel. My friend, we can never outgive God. Verse 5 now. So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to visit you in advance and finish the arrangements. For the generous gift you had promised, then it will be ready as a generous gift, not as one grudgingly given. These are opposites, friends. Generous and grudging. If you are grudgingly giving or generously giving, man will not know, but God will know. Man will not judge, but God will judge. One day we will be answerable. Let our giving be cheerful, generous and never grudging. Generous giving is the evidence of the grace of God working in our hearts. Verse 6 Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Apparently, it is more blessed to give than to receive. This was an expression which the Lord Jesus used constantly. Today, this verse is quoted a great deal, but practiced very little. Notice the equation with me. Sowing sparingly equals reaping sparingly. Sowing generously equals reaping generously. Here is an acid test for you and me today. Do we sow sparingly? Suppose a farmer would sow a basket of grain on a particular plot of ground and reap an abundant harvest. Suppose he would say the next year, there is no use of wasting a basket of grain on this ground this year. I will save half a basket for myself and sow only half. Any farmer knows that he would get a very small yield if he sows a very small crop. Why are some of us living such an impoverished life? 
It's because we had sown sparingly. Don't expect to reap a harvest of abundance if you've sown sparingly. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart, verse 7. Notice the emphasis is on the heart, not in the head. If you have decided in your heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, you can take a horse to the water but can't make a drink. God loves a cheerful giver. What you feel right down in your heart you ought to give, that is what you have to give. You should not give it grudgingly. God does not want any grudging giving. Grudging and giving are two opposites. If you're grudging, you're not giving. If you're giving, you're not grudging. What does that mean? God does not want one penny, one pie from you. If you'd rather keep it for yourself. You know, there was this great man. When the offering plate came to him, he put his hand in his pocket and took out a big note and he put it in. A few minutes later, he nudged his wife and said, I only wanted to give a small amount, but accidentally, I put this huge note. The wife said, don't worry. In God's account, you've only given a small note. Friends, God looks at the heart. Not only does it say God does not want you to give if you're giving grudgingly, he also says out of compulsion, he doesn't want you to give unless you are giving willingly, cheerfully, gladly. Some people say, well, I'd better give because everybody else is giving and if I don't put my hand in the offertory bag, they'd stare and even comment maybe. It'll look bad. It will give the wrong impression. Where will I hold my face if I don't give? That is giving of necessity. God does not want that kind of giving. When you give, have a smile on your face and give joyfully. Next time an offertory bag comes before you, smile. It is one of the most important parts of the worship service. Smile and give because you're not giving a beggar. You are the beggar. God is the giver. The beggar is giving God. Friends, smile, rejoice and give. Remember, it's only your note that is going into the offertory bag, not yourselves. If you had a choice, you would rather put yourselves in that offertory bag because he put himself on the cross for you. Verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. God is able to make all grace Grace is grace. What does all grace mean? God's grace is all grace. And when God gives, it always abounds to you. What is the response? So that in all things, at all times, having all that you need. Has there been any moment in your life when you're in need? If God gives, you will have all that you need because Jesus is all you need. You will have all things at all times because Jesus will never leave you nor forsake you. You will abound in every good work because you're in Christ and you're doing it in his strength and in his strength alone. Friends, Jesus is all we need. God is able to make all grace abound. I think the greatest words of our faith, friends, is God is able. God is able. Whatever situation, God is able. God is able to bring the high low, the low high. I have never known anyone who has gone broke in doing the Lord's work. There are many who say they are. There may be some who have, but really, they haven't relied on God's sufficiency in their work and service. I believe that God will bless you if you sincerely start giving. I don't think the blessings He gives you will always be material in dimension. A great many people think they can hold God to a promise of material blessings. I don't think you can. He does not promise to bless us with material as much as he promises to bless us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 9 now. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 9. As it is written, he has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower, bread for food, 
will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. Notice the concentration is always on inward holiness. The harvest of your righteousness. He will increase your store of seed. Immediately, mind goes to the material. But Paul's mind is always on the spiritual. The harvest of your righteousness. Friends, the spiritual is eternal. Material is temporal. This is a quotation from Psalm 112. It calls the man blessed who fears the Lord, who gives to the poor. Two things that we should always remember. Fear the Lord, give to the poor. If you don't give to the poor, you don't fear the Lord. If you fear the Lord, you will give to the poor. We are to share with those who do not have as much. I believe that in God's house, we ought to care for our own. We are brothers and sisters under the same fatherhood of God. We have to care for family. You wouldn't want to see one of your own suffering and poverty when you're living in abundance. That's what's happening in God's family. There are so many opportunities to share. Many believers have this wonderful gift of hospitality. It is a gift, a unique gift. But every believer has to practice hospitality. If you are in Christ, you will also give. They have a way of opening their homes, making people feel at home. Often, they take people from God's house on a Sunday morning after they hear the gospel, take them home and give them physical food after they've heard the bread of life. It's a marvelous way of witnessing, reaching people in your own home. Fellowship and witnessing go hand in hand. Paul gives the illustration of the farmer seed to the sower who doesn't mind going out to scatter basket after basket after basket of seed because he believes that he will get basket after basket after basket raised to a hundred harvest remember friends it is god who multiplies the seed of the farmer it is god who will multiply everything that you do for him don't be afraid give to the lord's work Verse 11 and 12 now. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. That through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Every way, every occasion supplying and overflowing. You see, friends, when you give, it will cause people to overflow in their expressions of thanks to God. It is God who will get the praise and the glory and the honor. Verse 13, because of the service by which you have proved yourself, men will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ, for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. Is anyone, anywhere, thanking God for your generosity? God, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you openly. So give in secret. Verse 14, And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Their prayers, their hearts, the surpassing grace God has given you. Giving is a grace. We are not commanded to give. It is not to be something under the law. It is a grace. God asks us to give as a grace according to our circumstances. You know, some of us can give much, much more than what we are. But we think we are doing God a favor in giving. Friends, God is able to do much more than we can ask or even imagine. Now Paul caps up the whole subject of giving by saying, Thanks be to God for His unspeakable gift. Thanks be to God for His indescribable gift to the Lord Jesus Christ. Regardless of how much you are giving, you cannot give like God gives. He has given an unspeakable gift. No man can approach the gift that God gave in giving His own Son to die for us. Think of this for a moment. 
We are back to what was said in chapter 8, verse 9. Though he was rich, he left heaven, left all glory, came down as a servant to this world. He came not only to live, but to give his life in death for you, to die on a cross, brutally killed, hammered to a cross, so that I might have eternal life. He made his soul a sacrifice for sin for you and me. We are told in Hebrews that he did this. Hebrews 12, 2 says, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Oh, my friend, he is a wonderful, glorious Savior. Don't ever bring him down to a low level. He is the bright and morning star, the Son of God who redeemed us. He is unspeakable gift for you and me. That is the very apex of giving. No one can go beyond that kind of giving. No one can outgive God. But yet, instead of giving, we have learned to accumulate, foolishly believing that it is more blessed to receive than to give. Men are merely taller children. Honor, wealth, splendor are the toys for which grown children pine, but which, however accumulated, leave them still disappointed and unhappy. Men are merely taller children. Children are never satisfied. Men are never satisfied. They love to accumulate. God never designed that intelligent beings should be satisfied with these enjoyments. By His sovereign transcendent wisdom, His goodness, man was formed to derive his happiness and virtue from God and God alone. God bless you, my friend.